I can be present with delusion or I can be present naked. And that's the main distinction I want to get across here between sort of ordinary mindfulness or mainstream Western mindfulness and the true mindfulness that the Buddha was talking about, the true suchness that the Buddha was referencing. Ash asks, The adept lives, oh, he's quoting something I said, <clears throat> which I actually quote from the Law of One. The adept lives more and more as it is. Can you expand on that? And more specifically on how, if there is a how, we can ease into that starting from now. Beautiful question. Honorable question. Thank you. The adept, which refers to the serious or sincere seeker, the seeker who has committed themselves to this path, they're prioritizing their spiritual awakening. It's different from, say, you know, the neophyte or the, the apprentice or the beginner. So it could be a beginner. That's why I love the term adept, because it refers to anyone of any level, as long as they're really sincere and they're working with it with a degree of passion. At least that's my version of this term. So the adept, aka the spiritual practitioner who is earnest about it, lives more and more as it is. Can you expand on that and more specifically on how? How do we live more as it is? How can we ease into that starting from now? Beautiful. Okay, well, let's start with what it is not. You know, when you go into a grocery store, let's say Whole Foods or whatever, and there's this nice little spiritual magazine with this meditating woman at the front and this mandala behind her. She's looking all peaceful and some kind of a yoga magazine. And you open it and there's another more article on mindfulness, which is good. I mean, I'm happy that this is entering into mainstream. But from a higher level teachings, I'm also kind of being facetious with it, making a little bit of fun of it so that you don't get hung up on that as the ultimate truth. It is cookie cutter. It is mainstream. You guys don't have to stick to just that. You can see through it. You can find more direct paths, direct ways. But sometimes, and I do love the, the true concept of mindfulness, which is to be aware. That's all it means. One who is mindful will not be so easily deluded. One who is aware. Okay. But sometimes how mindfulness is described is and also how being in the now can be described, is to be aware of the objects in your immediate vicinity, which is ridiculous because that's got nothing to do with what you are. It takes you further away from what you are. So as it is, to be with life as it is, doesn't mean to, in your mind, think about, hey, this is an iPad. And nothing else. This is an iPad. This is as it is. This is an iPad. I'm wearing these uh, little Taekwondo shoes at the moment. These are Taekwondo shoes at the moment. These are Taekwondo shoes at the moment. I am holding a cigar in my hand. I'm being really present with it. I'm being mindful of it as it is. This is a cigar in my hand. Okay, so that's not what it means to live as it is. That's cookie cutter yoga magazine kind of mindfulness, okay? No offense, it's great, it's better than randomly thinking all the time. And it can be a bridge, it can help you become more present. But what it truly means to be present, or more specifically, to live life as it is, if we take it one level further from where we were just at, for instance, okay, first I'm becoming present. And I'm defining this in my mind, which needs the mind, needs the solo body. I'm saying, hey, this is a cigar. This is a Padron 1926 Maduro, number six. Great cigar, by the way. So I can be present with delusion or I can be present naked. And that's the main distinction I want to get across here between sort of ordinary mindfulness or mainstream Western mindfulness 
and the true mindfulness that the Buddha was talking about, the true suchness that the Buddha was referencing. Okay? We have this tendency to sort of bastardize and simplify and reduce everything to, I guess, what it needs to be for people to even hear the message right now. So it's good in that sense. Again, I don't ultimately judge it. But I don't want you to get stuck there. So the main distinction between what the Buddha meant when he said be mindful or suchness and what Western yoga magazines usually point to when they say be mindful or suchness and what I mean with living as it is versus the yoga magazine, which describes being as it is by observing your yoga mat and your yoga pants and smelling the incense and being with life as it is, there's a major distinction there that's very subtle at the same time. And I'll give you five seconds to pinpoint what that is for yourself before I disclose it. What's the difference between being with life, living life as it is, like I just exemplified, and a true living as it is or deeper living as it is that I'm about to explain more? What is the main difference there? What do you think? Definitions. That's the main difference. Definitions. I can be with this experience as it is, without defining it, without interpreting it. Or I can be with this experience as it is, and define it, mentally project what it means, give it words, give it shape, give it form, give it names. Define it, interpret it. That's the main distinction. And then you're not truly present to presence itself when you define something. So the difference is being nakedly present or being present but full of thoughts and definitions and ideas. Suchness, to live the adept lives life more and more as it is, means that God guides you more and more as it naturally does without the filters of your definitions blocking it. That's a loving life. That's a saintly life. And it's possible for every human being listening to this message right now. And I am passionate about that, I suppose. I can be present now. You can be present with me now without defining anything that you're seeing or hearing. And then God starts to listen through you. A deeper awareness emerges or is revealed rather because it's always there. It's always in the background of every experience you've ever had, evenly so, this profound, intelligent, sentient awareness. If you don't define anything for two to five seconds, that's why I emphasize the two to five second moment exercise where you stop all thinking and defining, even imagining. Don't imagine anything for two to five seconds. What remains? Don't even imagine that what you're looking at within the room, the cigar, my hand, the space of the room, the size of the wall, all these things that we could say, well, they're just being as it is. But no, that's not the case. Because if you don't think about them, they cease to be. So they're not as it is. When you're thinking, oh, there's a wall over there, three meters away from me. It's got this color. I'm in this room. I'm carrying a cigar in my hand. You're literally removing yourself from life as it is by entering into this simulation, this holographic simulation of self-attributed meaning and definitions that then make it appear as if these things are really there as it is. But that takes you away from life as it is, and it enters mind as it appears to be. Now, the mind thinks it's referencing things as they really are, but that's just within the mind. And that just is a, what appears to be because when you stop all imaginal activities, when you stop referencing and defining objects out there and my body over here, when you stop referencing all of these objects, when you become objectless, even just for two to five seconds, which everyone can do, 
Not everyone can do it for two minutes straight or two hours straight, but everyone can do it for two seconds. That's why. That's the main practice. Stop all thoughts. Just will yourself as if your life depended on it. If your life depended on it, could you stop all thinking for two seconds? Yes, you could. Absolutely no excuse or limitation there. You're not handicapped. If I can do it, you can do it. It's the same thing. It's consciousness able to focus itself into a state of presence where you don't go out of your way to have any thought or reference about any object. You're not imagining anything. If your will is high enough, you can do that for two seconds, no problem. Now, in those two seconds, what is revealed? What remains to be recognized there? That is life as it is, and it is absolutely the void of a world. There is no world. There are no walls. There is no cigar. There is no you. There is no me. There is naked essence. That is life as it is, and it is beautiful, and it is blissful, and it is elevating, and it is clarifying. And it can interact with the forms of this world that you project are there when you do intelligently and skillfully and in satisfying ways and in useful ways, naturally, spontaneously, in unscripted manner. That's living life as it is, without filters, without personal interpretations or biases. A bias is something you tend towards. But if you tend towards something, you're going to create that, you're going to see that, you're going to find evidence for that. You're distorting life as it naturally is, because you're imposing your projection on it. So if you become present, but you're still labeling all these things that you think are really out there, like the wall and the cigar and your shoes and your yoga mat and the air you're breathing, you really think that's air you're breathing? You think that, you define that. It doesn't exist when you don't create it. That's life as it is. It's life without you. Oh, jolly, who wants that? Not you, but God in you wants that. To live life as it is, as it actually is, means life without yourself. What does that feel like? It feels like yourself. It's the state of like, oh, hi, how are you doing? Damn, I forgot all about you for months in a row. It's so good to see you again. It's so good to be with you again. That's life as it is. There are no walls. There are no finances. There are no other people. There is not even you as a people. There is no cigar in the hand. There are no things that you like and dislike. There's just you. There's just the essence of love and it's naturally radiating like a Taurus field. It's free energy. So the adept lives life more and more as it is, as the creator and less and less like it's assumed self, the assumption of itself. It's also complete simplicity, it's innocence. And it's paradoxical because it's intelligent. So the more you give up of the illusion of a world, and try to put yourself in my shoes for a second, having give up the world repeatedly over and over again, deeper and deeper, including myself, because my sense of self produces my sense of a world. And I can rest without any world experience and still talk to you and have a seemingly intelligent dialogue. How is that possible? Without a world, without a body, without a mind, without an assumption of you and me, how is this possible? Shouldn't, be in, shouldn't I be in some kind of a trance state? No. Shouldn't I be like unable to feed myself and live in a cave and be dependent on my students to come bring me food? No, that's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. It's got nothing to do with enlightenment. Absolutely nothing. It's a delusional yogic bubble. Don't go into the delusional yogic bubble. Okay? 
Without a world, you become more and more intelligent. It just happens. It just happens. It's like a movie that just happens. And it's spontaneous and it's unscripted. And you, if anything, you can marvel at its intelligence after the fact, after you said what you said. And you're like, oh, I didn't know I had that in me. And then you do it again. And then you top it again. And then you get even better at it. And then it happens even more skillfully. And then you navigate dimensional complexities, multidimensional simultaneous situations and problems and you see through it and you see to the end and you know what to do and, blah, blah, blah. and all the while you don't really perceive or feel there is any real world out there without your own world imposed upon it without your own biases the creator can flow through you and its intelligence becomes available to you more and more deeper and deeper purer and purer 